Today we continue on in this sermon series called Changing My Mind. And what we've been doing all sermon series long is we have been trying to understand how important it is to change your thinking about certain things. And uh, what we really mean by that when we're talking about changing your thinking, the reason we want to change your thinking is because we each have got behaviors and we've got actions in our life that need to be changed. And you're like, well, what's that have to do with my thinking? Well, Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 connects thinking with behavior. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so my behavior, my actions are really a symptom of what's been going on in here and what's been going on in here. And so hopefully this morning you're understanding why it's important to change your thinking because if you want your actions to change, if you want your behavior to change, well, it's going to have to take place through a change in your thinking because nothing is going to be different until I think differently. That's what we've been saying week after week after week, that, that nothing's going to be different until I think differently. The title of this morning's sermon is, When God Confronts My Stronghold. Do you have your stronghold identified? <laughs> What's a stronghold? Remind me again. A stronghold is a stubborn pattern of thinking that is resistant to what God's will is and what God's word says. And so the reason that we're not living the way that God wants us to live is because we've got some fortified patterns of thinking. We think we know our way is better than God's way. And what we've been doing so far in this sermon series is we've taken great care and a lot of time and energy and effort identifying and understanding what strongholds are. And we've been studying the life of Jacob so that we can better understand what a stronghold is. And so far we've learned some important facts from Jacob's life. We've learned that our strongholds are influenced heavily by my personality that I've got this stubborn pattern of thinking and the way that I think about things is directly associated to the way that my personality is. It's my interpretation of what's happened to me. And certainly Jacob had a personality that was unique to him from his twin brother Esau. And then we learned that strongholds also are heavily influenced by our family upbringing. That my parents influenced heavily my thinking about certain things. And certainly Jacob's family influenced the way that he thought about things. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that you, what personality you were born with or what your parents, how they raised you. Your, inf your strongholds that you have in your mind, your, your pattern of thinking is directly resting upon your shoulders and my shoulders. And so you're responsible for your actions and your behaviors and I'm responsible for my actions and my behaviors. And so today before we start, as we've been spending so much time, so much energy, so much effort talking about strongholds and looking for them in our lives, do you have your stronghold identified? Can you look at your life and say, this is a stubborn behavior this is a, 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 an action that is prevalent in my life that I know I don't need, that I need to get rid of. That I know that needs to change. Can you identify your stubborn pattern of thinking that's leading to your behavior? Because we're looking to destroy strongholds. We're looking to tear them down and to change. But if you haven't even identified what your stronghold personally is for you, then no way, shape, or form are you ready to tear it down. And so what I want you to do before we begin in Genesis chapter 32, I want you to think about your personal stronghold, that area of life that you know is a problem, a persistent and stubborn problem in your life because God wants to confront it. And that's what we're going to see in Genesis chapter 32. So let me bring you up to speed on what's happening in Jacob's life, okay? So Jacob, last time we left him, he was in on, uh, his dad sent him away. His dad Isaac sent him away to the land of Padan Aram to get a wife. Remember that? And so he went to go stay, Jacob did, he went to go stay with his uncle Laban. And he, while he was staying with his uncle Laban, he fell in love with his cousin who was Rachel. And so he works out a deal with his uncle Laban and he's like, hey, I will work for you for seven years if you let me marry your daughter Rachel. And Laban's like, okay, that's a good deal. 
So Jacob works persistently and hard for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, his uncle Laban decides, okay, we're going to have a wedding. And they have this wedding ceremony. And who does Laban give to Isaac to be married? Not Rachel. Not this beautiful form of face and appearance, Rachel. But Leah, her ugly sister. Laban tricked uh, Jacob. He deceived Jacob. And uh, well, anyway, if you remember that, that didn't even sway Jacob. He's like, I'm so in love with, with Rachel that I'll work another seven years. So he works another seven years and finally Laban gives him Rachel. So now by the time we come to Genesis chapter 32, 20 years has passed. Jacob has been gone from his dad, from his land for 20 years. He's been working and living with Laban. And he's got two wives, Rachel and Leah. And he's got all these sons. He's got all these livestock. And uh, well now, he's coming home. Jacob's going to return home after being gone for over 20 years. Well, let's read Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 1. Now, as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw these angels, well, this is God's camp. And so he named that place Mahanaim. Isn't that a great scene? That even after everything Jacob has been through, the lying, the cheating, the stealing, the deception, even after all of that, God is showing Jacob that he's still with him. That he hasn't forgotten his promise. God hasn't given up on him. Verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So uh, Jacob is now returning back to his homeland, the land that God promised to give him. And he's going to run into his twin brother Esau. Now you remember how that whole thing ended, don't you? A lot of time has passed, 20 years but it didn't change what Jacob did to his twin brother. Jacob stole his birthright from his older brother. Remember the whole lentil stew? Give me a bowl of soup. Give me your birthright. You're so hungry, you want some soup? Give me your birthright. Stole his birthright for some, stew, for some soup. And then he lies and deceives his dad to receive the blessing that was due Esau as well. And now 20 years has passed. And Jacob is coming home. And all the while he's thinking, I wonder, has Esau forgiven me? I wonder how this is going to go down. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I've been staying with Laban all these years, and I've stayed with him until now. And I have all these oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. You see what he's doing here? Horrible plan on Jacob's part. He's coming back and what he's doing, he's going to kind of test the waters to see if Jacob is, or if Esau is still mad at him. So he sends some messengers on ahead with a message. And the message that he sends the messengers with is a horrible message. Hey, I'm rich. I've got all the stuff. And that's a horrible message to be delivered to the brother that you stole from. Hey, God's blessed me. I've got life going really good for me. Oh yeah, and it's because I ripped you off in the process. So how do you think that's going to set with Esau? Verse 6, the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau and furthermore, he's coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. Tell me, how does that sound? Is that good news? <laughs> Jacob's like, I'm coming back and I'm rich. And Esau sends back a message for Jacob. He's like, oh yeah? Well, I'm coming too and I've got 400 men coming with me. You think that's good news for Jacob or bad news? For, that's bad news for Jacob. And so Jacob comes up with a plan and it's a horrible plan. Yet once again, look at verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and he was distressed. And he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two groups. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company, the one group, and attacks it, then the other company which is left will be able to escape. So he's like, I'm going to divide my family in half and that way when Esau comes to attack me, only half my family is going to die. 
Only half my family is going to get slaughtered. Are those acceptable or unacceptable casualty rates? Fathers? Dads? Half my family is going to die. I'm okay with that. This is a horrible plan. If you like to take notes, make a note of this. Your stronghold will be destroyed when my poor choices become a crisis. Your stronghold, that thing that you've identified, that stubborn pattern of thinking, that behavior that is so repetitive in your life will be destroyed when my poor choices become a crisis. What's a crisis? A crisis is a time of intense difficulty. A crisis is trouble. A crisis is danger. And if you've ever been in Jacob's shoes where you've been making decisions and you're, you know, it's not really the best decisions, but now all of a sudden, because of your decisions and your choices, now you've got an emergency on your hands. An emergency that's causing you pain, causing you anxiety, causing you to lose some sleep. That's when God has your full and complete attention, right? And God is using Esau to confront Jacob's stronghold. What was Jacob's stronghold? Do you remember? He was a liar. He was a cheater. He was a thief. That's what Jacob's strongholds were. And all this time, Jacob's been living his life. He's been making choices. And there really hasn't been too many consequences. But now, this is going to reach a boiling point. Because tell me, whose fault is it that Esau is angry with Jacob? It's Jacob's fault. It's the consequence of his decisions and his poor choices that has made his brother Esau angry. He stole from him. He cheated him. And now the full weight of Jacob's decisions and poor choices are marching toward him. It's reaching a crisis point. And if you've ever experienced that, where your choices finally reach a crisis, an emergency for you, what did you do about that? Well, hopefully you did what Jacob's about to do. He does the only thing that he can do now. He turns to God. Because it's reached a point that he has no longer any control over the situation. He can't lie. He can't cover. He can't run away. He can't take care of the situation. So what's, he's, what's he left to do? Turn to God, which is exactly what God wants him to do in this situation. When your choices turn into a crisis, that's when God wants to get your complete and full attention on him. And Jacob starts out doing the right thing. He takes the crisis to the Lord. He returns to the Lord. What does returning to God look like? What does returning to God look like? Well, there's three actions that Jacob took in our text. And I believe these three actions are a pattern that we see of what returning to the Lord looks like. First of all, we're going to see that he prayed, that he humbled himself, and that he tried to restore what he stole. Okay? He tried to make it right to some degree. Well, first, let's learn about Jacob's prayer. Because what a wonderful first step Jacob takes in this whole process of returning to God. Look at verses 9 through 12 of Genesis 32. It's his prayer. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the unloving kindness and of the faithfulness which you've shown to me your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan River and now I've become Two companies. Deliver me, rescue me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. Isn't that a great prayer? Can we all agree that's a great place for, es or for Jacob to start? Praying to God. No longer is he concerned about lying. No longer is he concerned about trying to manipulate situations. He can't. And so his crisis has reached a point that's caused him 
to turn to God. And so he's, he's, he's crying out to God and he's praying. And I love what he does in his prayers. First of all, he recognizes that he's unworthy of all the blessings that God has given to him. Verse 10. Second of all, he cries out in his prayer, deliver me, save me, I need your protection. And then in verse 11, he's reminding God of the promise that God made to him. That he's going to be prosperous, that his descendants will be great. And so as you pray, as you return to God, pray. And pray for humility, pray for God's hand of prosperity to protect you. Well, next let's look at uh, Jacob's humility. And really, it's, it's kind of subtly scattered all throughout the, the rest of our, our text here. We're going to read verses 13 through 21. So Jacob spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats. 200 ewes. Uh, 20 rams. 30 milking camels in their coats. 40 cows. 10 bulls. 20 female donkeys. 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hand of his servant, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on before me and put space between the, the droves. And he commanded the one in front, saying, When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong? And where are you going? And to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say to him, These belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he's also coming. Then he commanded also the second and the third and all those who followed the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob is also behind us. For he said, Maybe I will appease him with the presents that go on before me. Then afterward I will see his face, and perhaps he will accept me. So the presence passed on before him while he himself spent the night in the camp. Let me explain to you so you have a clear understanding of what's happening. Here's Jacob. He's marching on towards home. Coming out to meet him is angry twin brother Esau with 400 men. That's a problem for Jacob. So what's Jacob do? He's like, okay, what can I do to make Esau not angry with me? I know. I'm going to give him some gifts. And he divides these droves into, into groups of gifts for his brother Esau. And he's thinking to himself, when, when Esau is coming towards me, he'll encounter this first gift that I've given to him. Maybe he won't be so angry. But if that doesn't do it, then he's going to come a little further and he's going to encounter a second gift that I've given to him. And then a third gift and a fourth gift. See what he's doing here? He's trying his best to allow his brother's anger to subside with him. But in the midst of all that, did you catch his humility? Look at verse 18. It's subtle on Jacob's part. But as each group of gifts would encounter Esau... There was a message. There was like a, a tag attached to the gift. And it said this. These things belong to your servant, Jacob. It's a present sent to my Lord, Esau. That's you. This is the language of humility. He's like, I'm your servant. You're my master. You're greater than I am. I'm nobody. He's taking humility. Do you see what he's saying here? That's not all he does, though. He also tries to make restitution. He recognizes that he is stolen from his brother. He recognizes that he's robbed from his brother. And now he's trying his best to make up for it. And that's the reason that Jacob kept sending gifts to his brother Esau. Verse 20, Maybe with each present that goes before me, afterward when I see Esau face to face, maybe he'll forgive me. Maybe he'll accept me. Listen, your stronghold that you're dealing with will be destroyed when your decisions reach a crisis. And you've got no other choice but to return to God and be like, God, this is the mess I've created for myself. I need you to do something about it. And in your returning to the Lord, it's going to require you to do three things. The first thing it's going to require you to do is to pray. The second thing it's going to require you to do is to humble yourself. And the third thing it's going to require you to do if your stronghold has created a mess for you, it's going, to it's going to cause you to try to give restitution, to restore, to give back to those you've hurt with your stronghold. And you're like, 
Where are you getting this out of scripture? I would suggest to you this is not an isolated pattern. That every place in the Bible where we see God doing a work in the heart and in the mind of a person who needs to repent, these three actions always follow. Prayer, humility, restitution. The greatest example in the New Testament that we come to is the story of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus, don't you? In Luke chapter 19. He was this little short guy. He was a tax collector. How did tax collectors get their money? They overtaxed. They overcharged. They stole from people that they were taxing. And so Zacchaeus, this tax collector, is a thief. He's a robber. He's motivated by money. And he gets word that this guy Jesus is coming to his town. And by this point in Jesus' ministry, he was pretty popular. Everybody was talking about Jesus. So Zacchaeus wanted to go see Jesus. But here's the problem. He was short. He couldn't see over all the crowds that were in front of him. So what's he do? He climbs in a tree. What kind of tree was it? Do you remember? Sycamore tree. You know the story. So there's Zacchaeus and he's in this tree and along comes Jesus surrounded by crowds of people. And Jesus looks up in the tree and he sees Zacchaeus up there. And of course Jesus knows Zacchaeus. He knows everybody. And he says, Zacchaeus, come on down. It's like the price is right, right? Come on down. And what's Jesus want to do? He wants to have a conversation with Zacchaeus. I want to go to your house today. Let me read it for you in verses 6 through 10 of Luke chapter 19. And Zacchaeus hurried and came down from the tree and received Jesus gladly. And when those who were around saw it, they began to grumble saying, Jesus is going to be a guest of a man who's a sinner? Zacchaeus stopped and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Did you catch it there? This pattern of returning to God, of repentance, is what Zacchaeus did. He prayed, he humbled himself, and he paid back and he re restored what he stole. And you're like, where are you finding that, Mark? Where did he pray? Well, he had a conversation with God. Isn't that what prayer is? Having a conversation with God? That's what Zacchaeus did. He had a conversation with Jesus. Well, how did he humble himself, Mark? I'm not seeing this humility. Here's how. You've got a tax collector, one of these um, super wealthy elite members of society, and what's he doing? He's climbing a tree. Newsflash, wealthy people do not climb trees. He did. He humbled himself to be closer to Jesus. Do you see that? And then the third thing that he did to return back to God, he's restoring what he stole from people. Four times I'm going to return to people what I've taken from them. That is always the pattern we find in Scripture when it comes to returning to God. And if your crisis has kept you far apart from God, if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to tear down that stronghold, you're going to have to return to God. And it's going to require you to do three things. Pray, humble yourself, and then give back what you've stolen or taken from people. Well, that's the first way that strongholds are going to be destroyed in our text. But here's the second and most direct way that strongholds are going to be uh, defeated and destroyed in our lives. And it happens when God confronts me personally. When God himself decides to step into your life and confront your thinking and your behavior directly, that's when the stronghold is going to come down. That's when it's going to be destroyed. So returning to our text, all, after all the drama that Jacob has in, in trying to meet his brother Esau, apparently nothing has happened on the inside of his heart. Nothing's changed on the inside of Jacob's heart yet. He's still stubborn and he refuses to tear down his stronghold. And so God is going to step in and he's going to confront him directly. Verse 24 through 30. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. 
Oh, wait a second, Mark. I thought you said that God was the one who's confronting Jacob. Here it says that it's a man who wrestled with Jacob. Well, by the end of our text, I think you're going to see pretty clearly that the man figure in Genesis chapter 32 that's wrestling with Jacob is actually, in fact, Jesus Christ. The word translated man here in verse 34 is the Hebrew word ish, which can be translated warrior. This is a warrior who's come to do battle with Jacob. And all night long, this wrestling match takes place. Here's the thing I want you to understand is that when God finally confronts you directly and your stronghold, you need to understand that God is so incredibly patient. So incredibly patient. How long did this wrestling match take place? All night long. All night long. How many in people, can we just take a vote here this morning? How many people would, would vote that God could have ended this wrestling match like that if he so decided? Could have been over like that, right? And yet, all night long, God is patiently wrestling with Jacob. God is so patient. And maybe as you've encountered Jesus and you've encountered God and he's, he's confronting you with your stronghold, he's been so patient with you. I'm reminded of um, the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son requesting from his dad his inheritance? He's the younger son and he goes off and he goes and squanders it all and lives like a pig and ends up living with pigs because he has no money. It was only then when his crisis, uh, when his poor decisions became a crisis, he had no other option that he was going to return back to God. And what we see in that story is that he's got this speech all prepared in his mind. God, I, he's going to tell his father, I'm, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And in that parable, who does the father represent? It represents God the father, doesn't it? And in that story, we find God the Father, this Father being so patient with his Son. And when they have this reunion that happens, it's not a finger in the face, and it's not, well, I told you, and where's the money that I gave you? It's not that at all. It's, it's patience, and it's an embrace. And it's, I'm so glad you're home. God is so patient with us. And so God wrestles with Jacob until daybreak. Look at verse 25. When he saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. The hip socket is the strongest socket in the human body. I mean, you wouldn't go down in a basement with a buddy and be like, okay, we're going to dislocate my, my hip socket now. This is like two opposing forces that you would see in a car accident. A force going this way and a force going this way and then <laughs> popped out of socket. And it is one of the most painful injuries you can experience. And yet, even in this moment, make a note of this, we see that when God confronts us with our stronghold, he's so gentle. He's so patient, but he's also so gentle. What's the most painful thing that you've experienced in your life? Physically, emotionally. A couple of weeks back at youth group, Seth was asking the students uh, what's the most painful thing they had experienced or personally witnessed. And uh, we were kind of going around the room and, and sharing stories. And I shared with them my story, which was the most painful experience I'd ever had. It happened to me back when I was probably in the fifth grade or so. Um, I was making a skateboard, a homemade skateboard. Now I am not a good carpenter today. And I was even less of a good carpenter in the fifth grade, okay? But I decided that in the fifth grade, I was going to make a skateboard. And so I went to our garage, and I found an old piece of plywood. And I took a handsaw, and I'm sawing that thing in half. And then I fastened some metal wheels on the bottom of that thing. And I was so proud of it. And I decided I was going to make its maiden voyage in our church parking lot. We lived next door to the church in a parsonage. And the parking lot had a great, awesome slope in it. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to ride this new skateboard from the top of that hill to the bottom. It's going to be great. So I took my plywood skateboard and I set it down and I got on my knees and I was at the top of that hill and I pushed myself a little bit and I got about one third of the way down that hill and those cheap stupid metal wheels caught a rock and the skateboard stopped and I didn't 
and I fell off the front of that thing and I got up and I'm like, I think I'm okay. Man, my knee hurts. And I looked down and, and it wasn't any blood that I could see. But what I had was like a piece of wood the size of a pencil sticking out of my knee right here in the side. Well then instantly when I see what's happening, just tears, right? And, and I can't run because I've got this thing stuck in, so I'm trying to hobble back to the house. And I get inside and my mom's freaking out because she sees this piece of wood sticking through my jeans. And dad had to come home from the church and dad's there. And because he's a cheapskate and we didn't want to go to the hospital, what's dad's solution? We're going to pull it out. So I'm holding on to my mom's hands and, and dad's got a hold of it. And he's counting to three. On the count of three, we're going to pull it out. One, two, three. And he pulls on it and it snaps in half. And so now, not only does it hurt because, you know, the, the still stuck in my, my knee, but now I've got half of it, you know, that needs to now be surgically removed. And so we go to the hospital. And I'm just telling you, I don't think a fork in the eye could have hurt worse than that. It was really painful. But compared to what Jacob is experiencing right here in this moment, that was nothing. Dislocated socket. And yet I can say that God is so gentle. Because as painful as that was, it could have been a whole lot worse for Jacob. I want you to notice here. Here God dislocated his hip joint. I'm going to keep calling him God. Look at verse 25. How did this hip socket get dislocated? How did it get dislocated? What happened? What did God do? He touched it. Boop. He just touched it with his finger. Dislocated. Miracle. Humans don't do miracles. And, and even in this painful moment that Jacob's experiencing, it's still so gentle. It could have been so much worse. Can we all agree this wrestling match is kind of a joke? Can we agree with that? Now that we know who this is, that this is God that he's wrestling with, can we just admit this isn't even close? What are, were the odds that Jacob was going to win? I want you to think about that for a moment. This is God, creator of the universe, speaking things into existence, all-powerful, wrestling with a man. How hard do you think God was trying? Did you ever arm wrestle your dad when you were a kid? And you're arm wrestling your dad, and you've got both hands up there, and you're arm wrestling, you're trying to pull him down. And your dad's just kind of like sitting there. <laughs> and then finally, he starts to try, and he just puts your hand down. How hard do you think God is trying here as he's wrestling with Jacob? And how hard do you think Jacob was trying in this moment? Ah, I'm wrestling God! I think I'm winning! Sure you are, buddy. God didn't even break a sweat. This is a joke. God is so gentle. God is so patient. Why doesn't God just pin him and be done with it? Because God is gentle. Even after all these years where Jacob was lying and, and deceiving and stealing, none of us would think that God was over the top or out of line if he would have just been like, okay, I'm just done with Jacob. We're going to kill him and I'm going to move on. But God is so patient. God is so gentle. And hopefully this morning you can sense God's patience and gentleness with you. As you've stubbornly been wrestling with God in your stronghold for many, many years. And I so want to grow in my understanding and appreciation of God's gentleness and patience. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Verse 26 then God said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. Some scholars here believe that this is an indication that this man who was wrestling was actually Jesus. And because God cannot be gazed upon, he left before light came. He said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Again, this is a prerogative of deity. You're not going to come up to me after church and be like, hey, I'm going to go grab Dairy Queen for lunch. But before I leave to go to lunch, will you bless me? I'd be like, you're crazy. What's wrong with you? And, uh, and I really like Wayne Humphrey. 
I really think the world of Wayne Humphrey. I think he's a super nice guy. But if Dennis Schulte sneezed, I wouldn't be like, Wayne, bless you. What? We, it's, not, it's a prerogative of deity. We say, God bless you, right? We understand that blessing comes from God. It doesn't come from man. And so Jacob is understanding that this guy who he's been wrestling with is more than a man. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Verse 27. So he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Well, this seems strange, doesn't it? I mean, if this is a man, why is he changing Jacob's name? I mean, I'm not suggesting to you that Mark is the greatest name on earth. But don't come up to me after the service and be like, you know, I've been thinking about it. I'm going to change your name. I'm going to call you Fred. People don't do that to other people. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with, who's it say? You've striven with, you've wrestled with God, okay? Any more question about who this is that Jacob's wrestling with? It's been answered for you. For you have wrestled with God and with men, and you've won. You've prevailed. This is not the only time that Jesus makes an appearance in the Old Testament. Remember back in Daniel chapter 3 verses 24 and 25? You remember that scene, don't you? This king called Nebuchadnezzar built this statue 90 feet tall and he said, hey, when you guys hear music playing, everybody needs to stop what you're doing and bow down and worship this image of gold that I've created. And there were three men who defiantly said, we're not going to worship any other god but our god. And so when the music played, these three men were left standing alone. Everyone else is bowing down and worshiping. Remember those three friends' names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there were consequences for those who refused to bow. King Nebuchadnezzar said, whoever doesn't bow before this statue, I'm going to throw them into a furnace. And so these three men understood that their decision had consequences. Verse 24 of Daniel chapter 3 says, and so they get thrown into the fiery furnace and it's made seven times hotter. I don't know how he did that exactly, but this furnace was like cranked up. Verse 24, the Nebuchadnezzar, the king was astounded and he looked up in haste and he said to his high officials, hey, didn't we throw three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they replied, certainly, O king. Look, I see four men loosed and walking around in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Who was he seeing? Jesus. And here in Genesis chapter 32, we have the pre-Bethlehem Jesus Christ. Before the cross, before the empty tomb. Eternally existing. The, sl the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the earth were laid. The second person of the Godhead, God the Son, Jesus Christ, has come down and he's personally confronting Jacob and he's been wrestling with him for all night long. But notice, he's not in a rush. He's not hurried. He's not anxious. Why isn't God anxious or rushed or hurried? Here's why. Because God never loses. You need to hear that this morning. God isn't going to lose. Jacob was fighting to have his way. He wouldn't relent. He wouldn't stop. He wouldn't surrender. And God's like, it didn't have to be this way. But you're insisting on this pain. You're insisting on doing this. Can you see Jacob here writhing in the, on the ground in pain? Verse 27. So he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Do you think God knew his name? You think God knew his name? The answer is yes. God knows his name. So why is he asking him for his name? The reason that I believe God is asking for Jacob's name is because he wants to know if he knows who he is. He's wanting to know if he recognizes his identity. Do you remember what Jacob means? The name Jacob means cheater, liar, sketchy deal maker. And notice what he says to him at the end of verse 28. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. 
You may have been a liar, you may have been a cheater, you may have been a swindler, but you're not going to be that anymore. You're not going to do that anymore. You're not going to excuse it, you won't defend it. If, when you struggle with it, you're going to forsake it immediately. You'll never live and lounge and languish in that sin any longer. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob but Israel, for you have striven with God, you've wrestled with God and with men, and you've won. You've prevailed. But wait, Mark, I thought you said God never loses. Here, God is saying you've wrestled with God and you've won. How can I say that? Here's how. When you wrestle with God and you let him win and you surrender to him and God wins, that's when you win. That's the only way you win is when you let God win. And here in this situation, as Jacob has been wrestling with God, the only way that he was going to win is if he would let God have his way and God wins. Verse 29. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. And that's another reason, another indicator that we know it's Jesus. Because every time that Jesus gets asked a question in the gospel, what's he do? He always answers a question with a question. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Do you see the grace he blessed him. He wasn't, well, it's about time this stronghold came down in your life. Verse 30. So Jacob named the place Peniel. And he said, for I have seen God face to face. Yet my life has been preserved. You see, this was a defining moment in Jacob's life. It wasn't going to be the same for him any longer from this moment on. Verse 31. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel. And he was limping on his thigh. So for the rest of Jacob's life, with every step that he took, he would be reminded of the way that God worked in his life. I wrestled with God and I won because I let God win. Because I surrendered to God and I let him have his way in me. And I'm no longer a liar. That's not who I am. I'm no longer a thief. That's not who I am. I'm a nation. I'm God's nation. I'm changed. The stronghold in my life has been torn down. And it all happened because God came into Jacob's life and confronted the stronghold personally. And so as we wrap up this morning's sermon, the question of application that I have is this. Is God wrestling with you about that stronghold? That thing that's been so persistent and present in your life for far too long? You know how you're going to win in that situation? You're going to win when you let God win. When you let him have his way in you. Will you let God prevail?